All righty, guys. We are in store for a good show today. We're going to uh, be doing a full-on Q and answer, uh, question and answer uh, show because I believe the last two times we've had uh, our SPAF guest on, we really haven't opened the floor up very much to questions. We've covered a, very, a lot of stuff, uh, but we've not covered very many questions, and there were some good ones the past two times. So those of y'all, uh, when y'all get in here, start uh thinking of some questions getting them going i know uh it's kind of slow getting in here at the moment uh but i believe uh to kind of get started i'll lead off on some questions hey everybody that's coming in it'll take a minute they're starting to come in now um i guess um i we were speaking a little bit offline um about the the different special forces camps um could y'all uh maybe speak about what it was like uh flying to the different camps and maybe if you stopped there what the different camps were like uh did y'all ever when when y'all were flying to the camps did y'all ever have to help when they were under siege were y'all they ever fired were y'all fired at while visiting a camps or or anything of the sort like that uh, i know frank had a, an incident where he was uh, where they took some fire from what was it, Doc Peck, Frank? Uh, yeah, um, and but I mean, it wasn't that much. And uh, uh, we took uh, we took some incoming at Doc To on a couple of occasions. Um, we also took incoming at uh, Duco when uh, I started out working for CCS. But um, that was it. I think one of the most. I wish Phil was here. I mean, one of the most interesting things was that he and Doug. <laughs> And I can't remember the damn camp it was, but they landed out on the road, went in there to go have lunch with these guys at an A camp. And uh, Martha Ray was here. And so they wound up having lunch with Martha Ray and they got their picture taken with her and everything. And it was actually kind of cool. She was a colonel. She was a nurse. And uh, a green a colonel. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat. And that's not exactly incoming, but I mean, it was kind of fun. So. What was it? Uh, was it B fifty two that was between Kontum and Pleiku? I think so. Uh, okay, that's where Frank lived when he was flying otters, and Martha Ray was always there. I'd go by and visit him every once in a while, and she she hung out there. I think she had something in for the commander there, but I'm not. That that was a rumor, but uh, but she was always there, and uh, I think Phil Phil knew her really well. Yeah, I think so too. I, 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 I guess that's where that's where Phil was. Yeah, I, interesting I, lady. Yeah, that's that's where he lived the six months that he was flying otters. Yeah. The so, uh, th there's the it, uh, Colonel Maggie uh, is a wonderful lady. I mean, there's a uh, photo albums full on online of her visiting the different camps and especially the saw guys and the the air air support crews. I mean, it's amazing hearing uh, where she would go. I mean, she was going to some places that were quite hot. Um, and then I remember either at CCC or CCN one time, oh, bookmark flying. Um, she was at the base one time when sappers probed the base and everybody had to get on the perimeter and, and the whole nine yards. I, I always found it just astounding a she had that much devotion time and was willing to get out there heck actually i forgot she was under uh when a camp was under siege she came in and actually started doing medical work because they were short on doctors and and so many people were injured so i mean what a lady she's very good for morale i have to say that uh people like that they were they were kind of rare but she was uh she was extremely good for the morale, but she loves special forces and, uh, and they loved her back. Not to mention another standing order that she had that I've spoken to of several Sogmen that she told them literally read it, read it, wrote it down, her address, name, uh, everything, and told her when you get back home, you always have a place to stay. And some of them took them up on it and she, <laughs> no she just let them stay as long as they wanted. Others wish they would have, but I mean, what, what kind of, I mean, what a, what a lady. It was pretty yeah, cool. She was, she was that. 
Absolutely. We were we were with the two twenty third, weren't we, Jerry? The the aviation battalion, the two twenty third. Yeah, when uh, when I first got there, it was the two twenty third, and then uh, the fifty second took over. When did they take, when did they take over? Well, I can't tell you, but I'm going to tell you that it was a it was a bad deal for us because the two twenty third was all uh, fixed wing, as you as you remember, and. Yeah. And they they took care of us. They really paid attention. It's like you saying that you got what you have four or five. No, Phil, I think said he has four or five air medals or something like that. Phil should probably have about thirty air medals. Uh, they were really bad about processing the uh, the awards. Uh, and uh, like you you told you told me one time that you'd been recommended for a silver star. That's an impact award. And yeah. somebody, all you had to do is go find the orders for that and get that silver star. John but, uh, Pappas, John Pappas, before he died, look for that, look for that, look for that. And he made that his mission the last year of his life, and he could never find it. And John and I were put up the same day for that award. We we caught a bunch of guys in the open in the play trap, and Pappas was unbelievable. And and uh, just very quickly, the, we, we had this thing all organized. I was the low ship. John was flying at about... 800 feet and he was running the helicopters and we were blocking a wood line and I was running spads and uh, <laughs> this command and control helicopter shows up with I think it must have been a lieutenant colonel in it and John's running the show so he's got to talk to him and uh, so they they get on the colonel's frequency and, and the, whoever was driving that helicopter damn near ran into Pappas Pappas called him a stupid motherfucker and told him to get out of here. And he's yelling at him. And the, the part about this that is so funny is that when you look at John Pappas, you look at a cherub. You look at a guy that looked totally angelic. You would not think that he had this in him, but he did. And so when we got back that night, um, we were we were both in the in the in the bar in Play Coup at Holloway rather at the doghouse and uh Deaton comes in, followed by Ship, and Deaton said, just the two jerks I'm looking for. And he so he said, Which one of you called the colonel an ass a, a stupid motherfucker? And we both kind of went like this. <laughs> and 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 I could I knew this was a bunch of crap because Ship was in the back laughing. And that's when we found out that um, we had been put in for Silver Stars for all this. And it was it was a hell of a day. It was a hell of a day. But at any rate, um, the uh, that was the one that disappeared. That, uh, about six air medals, I, I, I did get 24 of them. Six are gone. Uh, two more DFCs are gone. Uh, Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry is gone. Thank you very much, 223rd Aviation Battalion. Yeah. Oh. The 52nd, uh, funny, I was just looking at the uh, a letter I wrote when I got back was uh, DA called me and said, uh, you you have a, a distinguished firing cross, but there's no orders for it. And I said, well, I said I, I was presented it. I mean, I, I, I stood in the formation and they gave it to me. So, well, there's, there's no orders for it. So I wrote the 52nd and they wrote me back and they said they, they found it and they sent it to me. And then they sent me some other awards. And then I said, well, I also should have gotten a bronze star for merit. Both of my daughters, by the way, have bronze stars, and I don't. And they're, they're for merit. You know, there's a bronze star with a V device for valor, but there's also one for merit that you're supposed to get when you leave. Everybody, everybody got one except for maybe Jerry. I don't know, but I didn't get one. I never got it. But that was the fifty second. They were those guys. I gotta tell you, Frank, you, if you didn't deal with those guys uh, often enough. Then you just didn't realize how they, they were they were rimps. They really didn't care about anything except doing their paperwork and going home. That may never oh. just Oh well. Yeah, I know. You know, I mean, I, I I don't think their fingernails ever got dirty. Well, anyway, the 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 two twenty third. That's what I remembered, and uh, I I I guess I should have remembered when we changed over to the fifty second. But um, you know, it, I just. I just wanted to. I just wanted to go home. <laughs> yeah. Well, most of us did, and most of us got to. Thank goodness. Yeah. We're um. We do have a question right here, but I was curious. Speaking of uh, officers and and uh, and assholes, so to speak. Um. 
<laughs> was Mr. Jerry uh, there when, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the man who took over that uh, had a yes, heart on for he your- was. He was Gus there. Wilder. Yes, I was, I was definitely there when Gus Wilder was there. Uh, I, I, Frank gave him a pseudonym, which I, Gus Fob or something. But anyway, I was, yeah, I was his pet, by the way. Uh, when, when Frank and Doug and Phil left, uh, I was his, uh, I was his target of opportunity. And he, uh, first of all, he didn't like my music. And uh, then he, he, uh, he didn't like that, my attitude, because I really, he wasn't, you know, like Frank said, and, you know, Phil, Gus was not briefed on our mission. And he was going to get briefed because there was no reason to do it. And so we, when we went out, when I went to the flight line, I had a, I had a job to do a mission and I, you know, I, I would always contact uh, the, the, the operation shack when I left and I contact him when I came back in, but I didn't tell him what I was doing. And all I did was record my hours with the, uh, with the flight clerk, with the guy who was recording hours. And other than that, I never told him, but Gus, Gus was a, uh, well, he, he eventually was was relieved. I mean, he, he wasn't. It, Arlie had enough to do enough of Gus, and uh, finally decided this, that he was bad for morale. And to be honest with you, I can't remember who replaced him. But the guy wasn't a bad guy. He just uh, he was just a replacement. Yeah. He, um, he's probably one of the he's probably one of the worst individuals I've ever known in my life. But when when he showed up, um, he he told the kid who was driving a Jeep to get his duffel bag and put it in his hooch. And I looked at him and I said, and this is what started it. And I said to him, you know, maybe you really ought to pick up your own duffel bag and carry it to your hooch. And he just looked at me and then told us to spec for to pick up the duffel bag and put it in his, in his room. And then he introduced himself and stuck his hand out and he said, what should I call you? And I said, you could call me captain or you could call me Captain Doherty. And Ooh. he introduced himself as Gus, and his hand was sticking out, and I, I would not shake his hand. Because, well, because he, he treated a, a, he treated a, an 18-year-old kid like he was a servant, and he's not. And it was ridiculous. So um, anyway, then then Jerry shows up, and uh, Gus, Gus gives him a briefing that lasted about four months. <laughs> Jerry came out of he came out of the briefing. He walks in. Phil and I are standing there. We're both laughing. And uh, and and, he, and the first thing out of his mouth is, "Who is that asshole?" <laughs> and I a beer. But the thing that set the thing that that ruined it for for me, which made it so difficult, was that every night, uh, and this and the, the enlisted guys when we were on the on the uh, MACV compound after we got moved off of CCC, um, every night. <clears throat> We'd say good night to one another, and we and, and, and all the all the all the crew chiefs and mechanics would be listening to this. So it'd start out good night, Phil. Good night, Frank. Good night, Jerry. Good night, Frank. Good night, Phil. Good night, Jerry. And then at the very end, all three of us together would go and good night, Gutswiler, you asshole. <laughs> I forgot. That. Night, I wonder he liked us so much. And he just, he just got, he hated us. And he just, he wanted the staff chief. He, he wanted to know, and Phil was beautiful. When, when, when Guts just practically threw him on the ground, he was so furious, wanting to know what we did. And Phil just very calmly said to him, why don't you go talk to the S3 over at the, the, at the CCC and at, at FOB2? And maybe he'll tell you, but probably he won't. <laughs> so, but he was just... So this is the, 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 the point here is that um, I was never a lieutenant. I was always in school. I started I started out when I graduated from OCS, I was a tack officer for three months. Then I went to flight school. Two months later, I'm in fixed wing school. And and then I go to the, the, the school in the, in the Philippines. I was, I was never a lieutenant. I never served as a, a, a lieutenant. So when I when, when Gus came in, I was a captain and I had never really thought seriously about making the army a career. But I really didn't think a lot about OERs either. I just did it wasn't cro didn't cross my mind. Well, when Gus left, he wrote my OER, and it was not particularly good. Uh, it, it wasn't terrible, but he, he he questioned my maturity and a couple other things like that. And uh, Phil Phil and I were when we were stationed together at Fort Polk. Phil kind of knew that 
that he was going to get rift because the rift was taking everybody. And it, it was really, it was so broad that it was just taking everybody. And I, I thought, well, they're not going to get me, you know, and I, and I talked to DA and they said, you know, you're really close to being rift buddy. And uh, you need to pay attention to, to what's going on around you. And so I said, well, I think I'm doing a pretty good job now, but uh, you're right. I, I will probably start paying attention because I, by that time, I was married and I, I kind of figured I better stay, better keep the job I had because like Frank, my grades were not very good and I probably wasn't going to be a stockbroker on Wall Street. So I better do something like stay in the Army. I had, I had a degree in economics, Frank. <laughs> it didn't help you a bit, did it? <laughs> <laughs> not a bit. <laughs> so the um, about the command and control that uh, Dark Star has asked about, um, when we went to... Uh, when we went to CCC, we were away from the 219th, so they did not control us. They did not know what we did, and they were never briefed on what we did. They had no idea. Um, so we were directly attached to this FOB2, and, and we took our marching orders from them. And in, in fact, I believe we took our marching orders from Mike Buckland. And uh, because he was the one who set all this stuff up without telling us. And, and I realize today that I, I'm, I'm alive because of him and also in spite of him. And so you know, anyway, it, it, the, about, uh, about organic, no, we, we were on our own. Um, the, the 219th came under the auspices of the 223rd and then the, uh, then the 52nd. But um what what we did was was totally off off the books, totally off the books. Yeah, uh, I can Hopefully. answer the question down there. It's um, it, it is a little bit confusing, but the uh, the the fifty second aviation battalion was part of the first aviation brigade. Yeah. First aviation brigade uh, was it in the train, um, and they had, had units all over Vietnam, which augmented the. Uh, the uh, units that were endemic to the, the divisions, like the 101st had had their own aviation assets and the uh, first cab had their own aviation assets, but uh, some of the other smaller units didn't. And so the, uh, the first aviation brigade picked up the slack and mostly the, the majority of first aviation brigade was uh, UH-1 units. And then I uh, probably the next would be the, the uh, Cobras and uh then Chinooks and uh, and actually there were cranes back then too. Uh, there were there were cranes stationed at uh, at Pleiku, which you didn't want to get anywhere near. By the way, in a bird dog, they were they, they made they made a bird dog hover. <laughs> um, the uh, it's Jason asked. I don't know, Jerry. You were you have a helicopter rating? I I tried to fly a Huey one night with a guy that was in the the uh, standardization office that I uh, worked in after uh, fixed wing shut down at Rucker and I was no longer instructing uh, them. Um, and we went out and I, I flew with this guy in a, in a UE. He was getting his flight time and I actually was allowed to log it. But I've got to tell you, I, I have no idea how I managed to remotely hold that thing still. I mean, I, I think I started out Dutch rolling and we just kept right on Dutch rolling. It um, it was just I was all over the sky. It, well, and it, it's amazing that it, it there's a and I know Bud knows this because he's there there at Fort Rucker. But it's just one of those things that all of a sudden it clicks, and and, and you can hover, and once you can well, hover, then you're gonna you're gonna be able to fly. Uh, well, and it's all about learning how to to hold the airplane steady and hover. And what we learned on were those th those huge th fifty fives. And not only did you have to control the uh, the cyclic and the collective, but also that you had to control the RPMs because they had a roll on throttle. Um, you know, if you remember on a Huey, uh, when you pulled up pitch, then it automatically uh, rolled in throttle. You didn't have to control it. But if you didn't watch the RPM on those small little things, then you you'd be in a lot of trouble. And it you know the, the IPs the first two weeks in flight school. In, in rotor wing flight school, they were, I mean, they were terrible to us because we just, and it was, it was all designed, but, uh, you know, like I said, once you learn how to hover and you're good to go. 
They actually have no, I am not a vet, so I have no idea about the helicopter. I do get to see them uh, fly and take off and all of that, and it looks hard enough. And hearing the guys talk about doing it sounds, I, I, I couldn't have been a pilot. So, I, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you, I, more power to you, men, for, for yeah. what y'all did. <laughs> but you, you pull up, it goes up, you push down, it goes down. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm I'm sure it's that easy. I'm sh I'm sure. I'm well, sure. Make sure your pedals are coordinated with your uh, turns. That that's the that's one of the issues I know I would have uh, get getting the getting the pedal issues correct. Um, I don't know if we've answered this or if this has come up before, but were y'all ever aware or did y'all come across any Raven men uh, or see any? I guess while y'all were flying. Only afterwards. What I what I did. So I, what I thought was really interesting was when, when we were at uh, um, Oshkosh this summer with Phil and another guy that uh, that uh, was with the 219th, it appears that the three of us all got offers from the CIA to go fly with a $10,000 bonus. But Phil didn't take it, neither did I. <laughs> but that I, I came in contact with a couple of guys who flew for the Ravens afterwards and they were flying at uh, at delta and um and so that's where i ran into them and i believe there were three of them uh and they were and they were all air force guys older than i was but i got to the airline first so they were junior to me and and i used to live i used to just love the kid the hell out of them about I, I, you're older than me but i'm senior to you and so i'm a captain and you're not <laughs> but that was it. I knew I knew what they did, and of course we all read the book. But uh, but to, to run into them, no. And, Real uh, cowboys, man. I mean, uh, they they yeah. were doing some wild stuff out there. <laughs> who, who was flying the Platus Porters that that landed at Air the, America? Air America. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. It was Air America, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It landed and, at Contum. Yeah, and just and but just so you know. The uh, the air the uh, Raven stuff that was all that wild and woolly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we were doing. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I, yeah, I was about exactly to say we it was the same uh, thing. They were just over on the other side of the other side of Laos. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I uh, that that's uh, you can see it in the photos. And there's a few good Raven books out uh, that I've gotten, and I've not read one of them. That's a more in depth history. But as soon as I look at the pictures and then read just a little bit, I'm like, that sounds just like the 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 headhunters at CCC, just complete wild men just out there <laughs> zooming the skies. <laughs> I don't um, know how wild we were, but <laughs> sometimes maybe. <laughs> there was, let me see. Um, oh, I was going to bring up one of our viewers uh, sent me some photos. Uh, he had actually, I, I'm not, I didn't get if he was a pterodactyl or not, but he flew out of um, CCC and uh, was flew radio relay and, uh, Evidently, it sounds like he was doing covey or fact work because he evidently saw some unsuccessful extractions. But uh, that's one of uh, if you're watching today, Mr. Al, um, hello. And um, if you are watching, please comment and let us know who you were with. I, I've for the life of me, have forgotten when we well, looks like the two. It looks like the 185th. Okay, and, uh, that, if, he was, if he was flying a bird dog, he's flying an army bird dog because of the paint job. Mm -hmm. and, and and the uh, flight suit. Uh, like I can't tell whether that's a. It looks like a regular Nomex flight suit that we wore. It's not air. Yeah, that's a flight suit. And and it, that's an Army airplane, not Air Force. So he wouldn't have been Cubby. He would have been uh, pterodactyl, probably. Wow. All right. Um, I just need to put that together then. He could have been. He could have been a two nineteenth, also, Frank. Because yeah, could he could have been. Because yeah, we, 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 we were in Bama to it. Yeah, because that's um, uh, Al Mokia and John Estel and um, yeah. Jeff Lugar. Those guys were all uh, uh, 219th. They got, they came up from the the 185th. And Lugar and I shared a commuter apartment in Salt Lake City. We were, uh, he, I was a 67 captain. He was a 727 captain. And I didn't know we flew for the 219th. We, I found out one morning at breakfast. 
I I've, I recently found and there's a few good questions I'm about to get to, but this is an amazing photo. I forgot I had and had posted, but uh, this is uh, I don't know if he was at CCC or not at this time, but this is Dick Meadows uh, on the Covey aircraft that he crashed in and they've come back and found it. And I have no idea what they're doing or what they're going to do with it or, you know, but uh, they're there nonetheless. Um, by any chance, he was in and out of country a lot. Did either one of you cross paths in y'all's career uh, I, with Dick? I don't know. I, the name is familiar, but I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know him. Uh, okay. I am familiar with that, with that program that goes out and searches for the downed aircraft though. That's a, uh, that's a really neat program. I talked to the, one of those guys just a couple of years ago. They're still doing it. They're still going out and trying to find them. You mean the joint re recovery person, uh, yeah, the that's, casualty? That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. So, yeah, that's uh, that's how they found Roger Pisacreta's aircraft. They went, yeah. Uh, Doing amazing work. Yeah. Um, we, still don't, we still don't know what caused Roger to go down. but uh, uh, Sadly, one of the SOG men that passed away uh, here recently, Spider Parks from CCN, he was back again searching for uh, – his teammates that had gone missing and he sadly had an accident and became comatose from an accident while in Vietnam or trying to get into Laos to go search and passed away and had to be sent back home and a very sad recovery mission. That but there guys are still going all the time to try and try and find y'all's brothers in arms, which is, yeah, I know. Uh, I have no desire to go back, but I, mm. but I've had a lot of friends that, that want to, I just don't want to. Did uh, did anybody go back and find Fritz Krupa? Yeah, they they pulled, they they recovered Fritz almost right away. I don't know uh, I don't know exactly. I, I, I was there, but uh, they were able to to uh, suppress fire and uh, they yeah they did recover him. They uh, um, just almost immediately. Jerry, how many how many um, solo missions did you fly? A lot how, of them. How about, did, did you fly by yourself? Yeah, I just I, I flew a lot of them. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just just I'm just thinking back on it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but I know I did a lot of radio relay, and uh, uh, I, I did I did some some VR without people in the back. But I did, you know, like like I was telling you one day, I, uh, just recently I start I started to remember when you started talking about Prince Sihanouk, Christmas Day, 1970. I flew the Mekong off across Cambodia and I didn't fly in, in Cambodia very much. And I was just amazed at how flat and different it was from, from the uh, Laos. Not nearly as heavily jungled. And yeah, uh, yeah. Unbelievable. All of a sudden it just turns into this flat plane and it's just, uh, I was just amazed at that. But, and, and, uh, but anyway, I flew a lot of, a lot of times by myself. Um, I had, you know, I had three warrant officers that worked for me and uh, they were all good. They were all good guys, and uh, I kind of felt like I was their daddy, so I kind of tried to take care of them. Wow. Um, I've got some photo of some terrain that I'm going to bring up here in just a minute. Um, someone said, uh, oh, gosh, thank you for that, uh, Stephen. Um, Stephen said he rode in an AN-74 landing at a Russian camp at the North Pole back in the day. Um, I have no idea what that is, but it, that the North Pole makes it sound pretty hardcore. So, goodness, I don't know what an AN seventy four is. Do you? No clue. Yeah. Yeah. I'll hit that on the Google machine right here. I'm sitting on real quick. Let me get to Jason's because he's got a question for y'all. Um, and spat and past interviews, I remember hearing about solo VR rides, and to me that seems much scarier than having a backseater. And I'm not sure why it seems that way to me. Was that the case for you? Being alone versus having, say, a Greg Glasshauser or a Bucky or whoever with y'all. You got you got Bucky for photos. Um, Glasshauser would have flown with us on a, on a, a, a pre-mission recon. Um, Jim, uh, rather, uh, Bill Spurgeon would have on a pre-mission recon. Uh, I flew plaster on a pre-mission recon. Um, a couple of other guys, uh, Terry Spoon. Um, but 
was <laughs> way too yes, glass house, way too often, <laughs> way, way too often, especially as the um, we got into 1970, we did an awful lot of stuff by ourselves. And I remember doing BDA right there with, for uh, B-52 strikes. And we were hanging around the edge of the AO after the last, and when the last bomb came down, we'd go in. And I was by myself. Mm. And uh, and sometimes I had a photographer, but a lot of times I had to do it by myself. And I, of course, I didn't take any pictures. I just went and looked. Um, the other the other one that I, I so distinctly remember was the first time that I flew out to the Mekong um, on that precursor to Tailwind. The... Um, I had a guy in the back seat, and it might have been Buckland, and but Phil and I flew together, so one of us had somebody in the back seat, and it was it would have been Mike Buckland. And every other time I did it after that, and I did it more than I'd like to think, um, I was by myself. Uh, and it seems to me that as the year progressed and we got deeper into 1970, I flew more and more missions alone. Um, I didn't have a backseat unless I was running a pre-mission recon. So a pre-mission recon for a, a one zero would be a, a pre-insertion recon, where we went out and we looked at his area and then came back, um, that sort of thing. And that's how I ran into Spurgeon and Plaster and and uh, the Wild Carrot, which would have been shortened, um, you know, these guys. That's uh, quite the list, and that kind of ties in with, my question, and actually Mary Jo has a question about uh, recons, and I'll ask I'll ask mine next. John's involved. Uh, Mary Jo wants to know, how often were you able to plan your recon routes to sunlight, as you mentioned in your book, the importance of the sun's movement with you? Your prose and is poetry, by the way, makes even war beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Jo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My goodness! <laughs> we, when you took off in the morning, you were you. I I would call it racing the sun to Laos, and I wanted to get there just as it was coming up, so that I could utilize the rays going sideways through the canopy and make it easier to see. If you were flying above the canopy, looking straight down, you weren't seeing squat unless you were in Cambodia, <laughs> and there wasn't as much jungle, but. In Laos, it was hilly and thick, and uh, you had uh, you really needed to be able to look sideways through through the the trees. And so, yes, you flew it down at about 100 feet, and you try to utilize. Yeah, that's a great place, and uh, you try to utilize the uh, the sun at your back, not in your eyes, um, looking through that stuff. So that's that was the the rationale behind that and then uh you know not not flying straight and level and not flying uh always flying in a in a in a crab uh going sideways and uh not um you know making making pedal turns on a treetop so you didn't dig a wingtip but that's there's just a lot of stuff that went into it but but yeah you we i, I tried to plan for the sun if i could and i like to fly in the morning too uh I, I like to get out as early as I could. Um, the thermals got really bad in the afternoon and it made it a little bit more difficult to uh, stay steady and, and keep find what you're, what you're looking for or do what you're supposed to be doing. And so I, I just, I prefer to fly as early as I could. Uh, and I definitely didn't want to come back after dark. Uh, Play crew had lights, but Contune didn't. And uh, if you had to come back after dark, then you needed one of the crew chiefs to, uh, get a quarter ton down at the end of the runway to give you some kind of a, a reference to be able to land land from, not to, because you don't want to land to the quarter ton. That would not be good. Uh, but, it, but um, yeah, I, 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 one good thing about Contum not having lights was we didn't have to do count them order. And, <laughs> and Frank, <laughs> Frank referenced in his book, it's <laughs> you know, three o'clock in the morning, you know, they got to get up and start flying around, around uh, uh, Play Crew Holloway. <laughs> and looking for looking for for people shooting mortars at you, which I, well, the worst. I found to be. I thought that was probably the stupidest thing that they ever made me do. But that was, that was just absurd. It was absurd. It was and, absurd. Absolutely. And we, as as staff pilots, 
Dark Star. We we only worked with <laughs> the Special Forces and the SF, and we only worked for CCC. So if if somebody was flying uh, for um, CCS, they weren't SPAF. Sneaky Pete Air Force was strictly at FOB2 with uh, Command and Control Central. And CCN and CCS, they had they had support. They had support from the 220th up at, uh, at CCN and from the 185th at, uh, at Ben Mutua for CCS. But, but we were specifically attached to CCC. And I, I have no idea what the rationale was, that, was for that. Um, I think m m Dr. Buckland explained it the last time he was here, but I, I probably was playing with my dog when he was talking about it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway, that's that's uh, that's that's who that's who we were. That's what we did, um, and didn't didn't fly missions for MACV. Uh, didn't fly missions for the. Uh, the uh, I think there was a, a big uh, A camp in Contum as well as uh, FOB two, and we didn't work for them either. We just B, worked for B fifty two, B B twenty four, B twenty four, B twenty. Yeah, watch yeah. movies over there, Frank. Yeah, we watch movies there. No, we got thrown out of there. <laughs> well, it must have been after I got there because we went on. What was the movie with uh, Ryan O'Neill and uh, and Lee Taylor Young that Phil Phil, Phil was enthrall with uh, I, I i don't know but if i gotta I, tell you <laughs> he uh <laughs> this is but phil phil had phil could play guitar i mean he's really good and he still plays by the way he, he has a band but uh we we watched this movie and of course the movies and i know this is kind of an aside but the, the movies were, when we got them they were they were torn up they were awful they were always breaking the film would break the camera would would flop or something like that, and and people would throw beer cans at the, at the screen, and it was uh it was always a mess. But uh, but anyway, this one particular movie uh, is a is written by Elmore Leonard, and uh, Phil Phil just really fell in love with that movie, and it was there was a theme song that went with it, and he got on his guitar and he started picking on it for maybe a week, and finally picked out that theme song. <laughs> he was so proud of himself, but uh, we uh yeah we 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 had uh, we had we had movie trouble sometimes. Well, he, if you, if you went anywhere with Phil, you stood a 50, 50 chance of getting to stay, but only 50, 50. You never <laughs> knew. You never, you never knew. Um, the other thing that cracked me up when we, when he was on with, with, with you and me, bud, was that, and Bucky, he actually referred to his first wife as, Naked Sandy, and and I almost fell off the chair laughing at that. I thought that was hysterically funny, and uh, because of the because of the poster, which we've talked about and beaten to death. But but uh, Phil's post poster of Sandy, so he called her. I nicknamed her Naked Sandy, and he called her Naked Sandy. I thought that was was very very funny. And I love to kid him about playing because he still plays in a rock band, and these guys are these guys are geriatrics. I mean, hell, they're in their mid to late seventies and they're all playing. And I, I told him that the, 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 the girls were throwing underwear at him up on a stage. And I said, you could probably climb up on the roof of the building and jump off. Use those suckers as a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> Get them off. They're like, what in the hell? Uh, that, that's pretty nice though, that they're, uh, they're, they're, they're still playing and everything. I, oh, yeah, I like pretty... seeing the song photos of y'all. Uh, those of y'all that did play instruments. I love seeing y'all actually messing around with instruments and stuff at the, at, at the bases and everything. Because well, evidently Phil, some of the song guys could pick as well too. Yeah. Uh, well Phil was very, very good. He had a he had a uh, an electric guitar. I don't know that he had an amp, but uh, he had an electric guitar with him when we were at uh, in uh, in Contum and he played it and it was terrific. Wow. That's so it cool. didn't make Gus happy either. <laughs> I can imagine so I was about to say he was probably not his biggest fan. Um, yeah. Ricardo yeah. has a uh, question for y'all about y'all's radios. Um, was yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm reading a question. Uh, well, we had a, a FM radio, which we communicate. Most of our communication was done on FM radio. We had uh, high freak radio, and we also had uh, an yeah. ADF, uh, which we, which we didn't use for navigation. We used to listen to AFN. 
Uh, I think that's about it. What, uh, bridge too far, Ryan O'Neill. Let's make the Brits remember that. <laughs> uh, that's not that wasn't no, that's not no, what it was. That, that, no, that's uh, I'm gonna have to Google that right here too as well, or else he's gonna. I'm yeah, one he of those people. If I don't far, but, uh, if I don't figure it out, it'll, it's gonna eat me up. Um, some, no, some well, if you Google that, uh, that you'll probably find it. But uh, that the uh, movie we had uh, Ryan O'Neill and Lee Taylor Young, and Lee Taylor Young was. Uh, I think they were buddies back then. Back this was like you know in, in the late '60s, and uh, I think uh, off screen they were friends, close friends. And uh, anyway, it was uh, it, it was it wasn't a great movie, but it was it, it certainly was uh, entertaining. <laughs> was it the games or the big bounce? The big, big bounce. bounce. Big bounce. The big okay. bounce. Yeah, okay. that's it. Uh, I'm glad we found that out because it Thank was going to so absolutely <laughs> kill me. The truth, the big bounce. There you go. We didn't. We we never. At least I didn't. Uh, I know that I used to see this the uh, repelling, practice repelling and uh, out of a tower, uh, but I never did it. Uh, and um, I, I'm not. I, I I guess that three stars was asking about uh, static line jumps. Oh. The airborne did. Um, I, I know those guys, the the, the uh, Psy guys practiced, but and they were getting ready for the high altitude uh, uh, jumps. But um, I, I I never was involved in any of that. And as far as time off in the base camp, I don't know what how it went at towards the end of your time at CCC. But I don't remember getting any time off. We uh, we were going gangbusters until at least I went home, and um, I know Phil and I got two days off when Cianuk was overthrown. That's when we went up to the Stone Elephant, and uh, and got so drunk we barely found our way back to the airplane. But other than that, you know, R and R now is about it. Downtime at base camp that never happened. R and R and weather weather would get us sometimes, but sometimes, but that, did we. You know, I I remember flying that thing in the rain, sticking my head out the window, trying to see where the hell I was going. And this is this is when we I got into uh, got into it with uh, with the ops officer at the, at the CCC about fuel and having to zigzag down valleys because if you flew in a straight line, I said this before, if you flew in a straight line, you didn't burn as much gas. It's simple. But if you zigzag down valleys trying to pick your way uh, through rainstorms and, and stuff, you're eating gas. And I told him we were going to get nailed uh, way the hell over in Laos and not going to be able to get back. And that's when he cut my map off at the Mekong and told me I wasn't going to Thailand. No R&R for you, pal. That one still uh, bewilders and blows my mind that he did that. Uh, that cut your map up. No, so yeah. downtime was downtime was just not that was not happening. Nighttime. Um, yeah. We didn't fly at night. I didn't no, fly. That was it. Yeah, that was that was downtime. Yeah. Flying at night. I can't imagine. There you are, Ace Ventura, hanging your head out the window like it's your car, <laughs> and yeah, and you looking you trying to see. I mean, good <laughs> lord. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't have to fly at night because there was a terrible mist of scotch everywhere. Oh, God. <laughs> well, we didn't have no. any nav aids or anything like that, except for an ADF. And so, you know, if we got caught, we were, we were in weather, we were we were in pretty deep trouble. Yeah. And the uh, you had to land at Pleiku Air Force Base with uh, if you had to fl fly an ADF approach. And that was uh, a little tricky, too, because there were mountains between Kantum and and play coup so you had to fly you had to be at four thousand feet i don't know it's just it, it, it was it wasn't gonna work I, I did i never i never flew an instrument approach in vietnam i did yeah well i did i never did I yeah did. I, phil did phil did all the time in, in the otters well i flew it when i first yeah. got there and flew otters i flew, yeah, into, flew otters, yeah. into, into uh fubai and uh we were it was that's all we had and we were so far below minimums we landed anyway. Yeah. I mean, I've got the damn thing lined up on the runway, and and we 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 just kept coming. And I <laughs> when I got to ten feet, I was I was going to have to go around. But the auto was slow, 
So, you know, you, you could really pick your way. And by God, there was a runway. We landed and we spent the night in, uh, in, in Fubai. And the, the air, airfield commander, we we're kind of getting out of this, getting out of the otter. And, and the, the, this jeep pulls up and this, this, this major gets out and he said, and we're a couple of lieutenants. And he said, how the hell did you get in here? And I, I looked at him and I said, I, I'm really not sure. <laughs> I, said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but I didn't have a lot of choice. You know, where, where am I going to yeah. go? When so, you don't have any fuel, you, no, you, know, you, can, you're out of ideas and altitude and airspeed all at the same time. You're screwed. So, you got to find the airfield. Yeah, you got to yeah. find the airfield. You got to, you got to just find it. So yeah. we just found it. So anyway, yeah. I understand that hatchet force missions. Yeah. Did you did that? Didn't you so in support of hatchet force mission? I did. What's that? In, in, in support of a, a, a hatchet force mission. Did you, did you did you fly any of that? Cool. No, well, I, 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 flew, together, I flew every mission that CCC gave me, and yeah, I did fly that. And uh, I, uh, you know, I just I, I flew uh, BDAs. Uh, I, I I flew radio recon. I flew uh, yeah. VRs. You know, the first first time I flew over the the uh, over the line, you and Phil took me out there, and. Uh, you were just kind of showing me the ropes and I think it was probably not authorized by a CCC or whatever, but you were trying to show me what, what was going on. And I, we went out and uh, we were flying down the trail and, um, and I, I was, they, you guys said, you, you go down and fly low and see what you can see. And I flew over something that wink, winked at me. And I told you, I said, Frank, there's something down there. And he said, get you, you said, get out, move. Oh wait! And I said, "Well, <laughs> I said, well, there's something there, and 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 you were adamant about it. You said this is not a mission. You get away from whatever you saw down there." And so, uh, well, it was, it was probably a a, a truck or something that yeah. uh, that I saw down, but I don't know. And as far as flying, how low did we fly? You flew as low as you had to. The rule was supposedly 1,500 feet, and you weren't supposed to go down below 1,500 feet. Well, you couldn't see it at 1,500 feet. That was a waste of time. So, you know, how low is too low? It's too low if you were landing on the road. <laughs> pulling tre pulling <laughs> trees out of your landing yeah. gear when y'all get back. Flying around trees. It, it just, that's, that was, you know, it was too low when, it, when somebody threw a rock at you. So, but you, you just, uh, you, you had to make it work. And so make it work was th the idea. Um, and so how low is too low? Too low is when you ran into something. Well, they're or, no power or, or, or yank up because you're going to run into something. <laughs> but uh, you, were, you, just, you just got down where you needed to be to see what you could see, to find what you needed to find. And, uh, you know, sometimes you got stitched up pretty good with uh, – with the ground fire and sometimes you were lucky, but, but too low is, I don't know what that was, it, but you know, hundred was a hundred feet too low, 50 feet, 30 feet. I don't know. When we flew the, that deal where they took the picture of Seanook flew down the middle of that road. I, th I don't think we were more than 20 feet off the ground. So, yeah. and that's well, when I asked Buckley if they, if you thought there were any, any, any uh, electrical wires or telephone? Yeah, there's no power lines. <laughs> Don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so anyway, that was how low I know. Too low. That's the hazard of flying low in developed countries, but it, it wasn't a problem there. Yeah. That I've I've got a kind of, one goes back to the hatchet force, but one uh, the the first one since we're talking about flying low uh, can kind of involve both of you. Um, I'm always curious when y'all are flying and y'all happen to get around when there's troops in contact. Uh, have y'all ever because uh, guys, if y'all can find this, uh, my good friend Brandon Brewer sent me this book. It's called Hit My Smoke: Facts in Southeast Asia. Uh, by Jan Campbell, no, Jan Churchill, I'm sorry. Um, and he was talking about his, uh, one of the Covey pilots was talking about his first mission out uh, supporting Project Delta. And the team had gotten so o almost overrun that, that he couldn't tell who was shooting who. 
and he was asking permission to fire and they said no 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 or his pilot the rider said no his checkout pilot because they didn't know who was who but at the time he said that the team leader on the ground said fire us up we'll dig in and they did it and luckily it saved them a few guys got injured did y'all ever have any situations like that to where the team was so about to be overrun y'all couldn't decide who was who in this situation well the, it was always a problem when teams were in contact to, to determine who was who but uh it was up to the people on the ground to tell us where the enemy was and of course we didn't have anything to shoot them with all we had was the able, ability to call in uh tack air from someplace whatever what whatever was available that day and normally it was the spads but uh it was it was the people on the ground who would I can remember a couple of occasions when I was talking to somebody on the ground and they were saying, well, you know, they're, they're West and they're a hundred meters and, and that sort of thing. And so that's what I would tell the SPAD pilots, but uh, uh, we, I didn't have anything to shoot at them. I mean, I, every once in a while I'd, I'd have some nails or some HE, but that was, it wasn't always. And we, you know, we had smoke rockets, but they're not going to hurt anybody. Well, they were, they were white phosphorus though. So if you hit them, they were going to burn until they had only <laughs> else to burn. But um, so, and as far as Jason asked about survival gear, uh, I don't know what you carry, Jerry. I had a survival vest. I don't, I, there was stuff in it. There was a, a little fishy line, a fish hook, and there was a, a beeper and there was a, 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 a like a pin flare um, and a knife and some other stuff. I but, still have mine. Hmm? I still have mine. You do? What I have, yeah, I don't have all the stuff for it, but I have it. Um, you know, I told you in, in the last one, this, my, my survival gear was a car 15 with a bag full of magazines and uh, and the guy in my back seat. That's right. Uh, I'm following you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't trust. I didn't trust the beeper. You know, you remember you you. How many times did you hear beeper beeper come up guard? You know, it's because somebody's out there playing around with one of those beepers and. And people would, you know, take it as a real emergency. Yeah. I can't tell you, every time I flew, I heard somebody come up on guard and say, you know, beeper, beeper, come up on guard. And I, so I didn't trust those things. Um, no. The knife I kept sharp, but uh, but I but my uh, my survival gear was that Car 15 and uh, a, a bag of magazines. And I I figured, you know, if I was by myself, I was in deep trouble. But if Bucky or one of those guys is in my back seat, then I might have a chance. I'm, I'm following you. If I survived the crash. So, so to piggyback on that, and as a matter of fact, you I was just watching the part where you were talking about that and you said, Bucky, uh, I think Bucky was with you and he said, do we? Do you have a plan if we go down? And he said, absolutely, and went into it. And um, I believe Jason was kind of curious and someone else is bringing up uh, something about a vest. Uh, some of the pilots here have a survival vest or anything. Did y'all wear anything i know it was too cramped to carry a parachute and everything and much less to get your grenades and car 15 did y'all have a a vest with a knife a panel or anything like that or yeah that's what we were just talking about it was a okay. mesh vest and yeah. uh it had what a fish hook in it yeah. and uh <laughs> i mean it was really kind of ridiculous but uh but it did have a it have a had a guard radio and uh yeah. and it produced a beeper and you could when when we flew we we were tuned to a certain frequency but we also had guard on that frequency so if someone came up with an emergency they they were on guard and uh, we could hear it so we could hear the beepers and people would play with them i mean they would be on the ground someplace and they'd play with those things and uh so no one trusted them i i, I certainly didn't uh i can't remember what all what there was a knife fish hook uh it wasn't anything like what Slim Pickens had when he was flying at B-52 in, in, in the inventory. <laughs> Jason, with the, with, the, with, the, with the vest, what you got to remember was that the, the deal with us was that we were on our own. And we, we got car 15s. That was great. And we had a personal weapon, uh, either a 45 or a 38. Thank you very much. But anything else that we had, the survival vest or that we scrounged, we we found 
or somebody, you know, we, maybe we lucked out and company gave us one, but pretty much we were on our own. We were, a, nobody knows us. And when you think about it, over the course of, of, of uh, the SPAF operation at a CCC, there were probably only 15, 14 guys that flew the mission. There weren't a lot of people. It was, you know, the guy, guy flew for uh, six, seven months, and then he rotated out, and somebody came in and took his place. And it, it, it started up in uh, like around 66, and I think it ended at 71. So you're not talking about a lot of guys. And um, so it was, we were, we were a little bunch of guys. And Steve asked about teaching. Uh, I taught, uh, when I came back from Rucker, when I came back from Vietnam, I went to Rucker and I taught it from the back seat. I, I instructed bird dog flying. There's Phil. And the guy in the middle is Mel Schlettner. And the guy on the right is Michael, Michael Buckland with his camera. So I taught, I, I taught until, <clears throat> fixed wing was uh, discontinued. And then later, after I retired from Delta Airlines, I went to work for Boeing and I taught uh, Korean pilots how to fly an A320, A321 Airbus. And I did that for almost nine years. Uh, so that's that was my my uh, my deal with uh, with with teaching. Um, with, the, with the three stars asked about uh, red smoke on target. Um, no, you know, um, you, you never told, you never told them what to pop and they never told you what you were going to, what they were going to pop. And so if he popped a red smoke, uh, he'd say, I pop smoke and I'd say, I've got red smoke. And that, that's how, because if you said pop red smoke, you'd see 20 red smokes going up and you couldn't do that. You didn't want that to happen. You, you needed to know where our guys were. So um, that's, that's essentially what it, what, how, how that worked. Um, the Willie Pete's, that, that was white smoke when you fired a rocket or you threw, you threw a, a Willie Pete grenade out the window, but that was pretty much it. And um, so anyway, uh, hey, uh, I've got uh, a, a, a question because I've got a, a photo that, that kind of coincides. And then I'd like to ask Mr. Phil about his special mission uh, with the with the hatchet force. Actually, there's two questions for Mr. Phil that are going to come up. And then there's a photo I'd like to talk about. But maybe both of y'all worked. I know uh, clearly uh, Mr. Frank did. But what was it like flying Mr. John Plaster around? Uh, you speak about it in your book. Uh, for those of y'all that have not bought the book, oh my God, I don't have it it's sitting over here. I'll grab it in just a second. Um, it's linked in the show. There it is. Um, it's linked in the show notes. Please go out and buy it. It is a wonderful book. But what uh, what what was the man himself like to to fly with? What what was he like? Did you fly him, Jerry? I did not. I did not fly with John. He he introduced himself as Plastic Man, and um. I looked at him and started to laugh, and I said, well, if you're going to be Plastic Man, I could be Captain Kangaroo, but I, I really kind of need to know your name. And so he, he told me, and we flew a mission together, one. Um, he brought a box, which I wasn't paying attention to, because where we were going was a really crappy area. What he had, I had in this box was a whole bunch of claymores packed in the middle with C4 and and uh, I, a way to detonate it. And he had a red smoke grenade to mark its path down. And he pushed this thing past my shoulder. And that's when I realized the sucker was going out the window and it was a, a big <laughs> kablooey that he had. But, and then on the way back, we went and we looked at the area and uh, I, I said to him, are you jiggling your knee? And because I thought he was jiggling his knee in the back seat, maybe banging his knee against the bulkhead. And it wasn't. It was a 12.7 and, and they had a slow rate of fire. And this guy was chunking away at us. And I thought, holy shit. So we just get, got the hell out of there and, and didn't climb for hours. So I didn't climb. Then heading back to uh, to uh, to Contum, And he, he starts talking about asking his father to get a bugle. His father couldn't get one. So he got an air horn. And in one of his books, he talks about blowing that air horn off on a mission. 
and he's uh, in a uh, on one side of a of a ravine, NBA or on the other, and they've got him pretty well boxed in, and he blows the air horn, a sound they'd never heard before, and they all ran away. <laughs> that was that, and I thought that's just the funniest damn thing. Then he, there's a picture of him. He had a little brownie camera, and he took a picture of himself smiling into so one of the first selfies ever and he's smiling into the camera with this big fat grin and um he's uh he's uh that's the air horn and he said if, if they if they kill me they're going to take this camera they're going to develop the picture it'll be the last thing they see and I thought, well that was that was okay then yeah there he is then um we were watching my daughter and i were watching T fritz krupa god good guy. My daughter and I were watching TV and a program on the, the secret war in, in uh, laws came up and there's plaster and he didn't have any hair on his head then, but he had a great big handlebar mustache. And I said, I know that guy. And my daughter looked at me and said, what do you mean you know him? What are you doing? How come you know him? And, and, and What's this stuff about Laos? I said, no, 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 no. I'll tell you sooner or later. I'll tell you. And uh, so anyway, that was all very funny. Paul Slafter was, he was kind of nuts. So um, I mean, it was fun. Good yeah. guy. He was nuts. <laughs> I, I was no, about later. to say, kind of is uh, being very, very kind. Some of the missions I've heard uh, is just, uh, just wild, wild stuff. I mean, the ashtray mission uh, where he had the air horn, um, then, uh, of course, that one where I didn't even know he had the, the Claymore, but he was notorious for building all kinds of uh, goodies. I think he picked up that from Joe Walker, to be quite honest with you. Did too. <laughs> There's him and Mr. Glenn with uh, Doug Miller and RT Vermont kind of looking back. I wish I had the photo you were talking about that he's looking literally the cameras right here. And it yeah. is the, a perfect uh, modern day selfie. Um but what I, I was looking for the photo, I got to meet him in Las Vegas, and my God, what a guy. Nice man and even lovelier wife, sweet lady. I uh, helped him unpack his books and get ready for the week. So uh, outstanding man. He was a he was a he was an absolute character. He was he was very I think he was also he he may have been, I, I could be wrong, but he may have been the one zero and Krupa was the one one where they, they uh, blew a truck, blew the tires off a truck and snatched a driver. And Krupa also had a brownie. And so they lined the team up in, in front of the truck where they just blown the tires off with claymores, which make a little bit of noise. And Krupa's taking a picture of the team with his camera. And then, and then they run. They can hear these guys coming down the road, the NBA coming down the road, and, Group is taking pictures and then they then they take off and I thought you know this, that's just crazy. That is a who's who on that mission. Uh, that's Ashtray Two. John yeah. Yancey's with him. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I forgot the other man, but two Delta men: John Plaster, Mr. John Blah, who's been on the channel, yep. and I think Mr. Bill Spurgeon was with him actually Boy, that Spurgeon day. Was too, but but the but the guy that I remember the most was was Krupp, and I think he was a lieutenant at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I, I, it was the first time I'd ever heard of anybody taking a, taking a picture on, on, on the trail. <laughs> the truck's tire. <laughs> you, you, Especially you know, in such a high risk situation. Yeah. I can understand in, in the bush or something, but when you've just blown something on the trail, it's like, we, we've got no time for photos here. Let's roll. <laughs> Um, there's, a, a, there's a guy who d doesn't live too far from Frank. And just speaking about plaster, um, his name is Peter Colt, which I think is a, a non de plume. But he writes uh, he writes novels about uh, a detective in Boston who was a one zero at CCN. And uh, this guy is not old enough to remember Vietnam. The guy who's writing the books, uh, I've, I've communicated with him when I first reading his, started reading his books because I I flew the mission. And uh, anyway, I. I got in touch with him and I said, where did you get all this information about from, from the, about the one zeros? And he said, I read Plaster's book. And I said, yeah, I said, it's obvious. I said, I, I could, everything you wrote in there, I could tell that's where it came from. And he said, anyway, he's written five books. I'm kind of giving him a plug because uh, it's uh, they're, they're pretty good. And he, the guy 
has flashbacks to uh, to the, the what the one zero who's the hero, the, the protagonist in the novel. Um, his name is Rourke, but but uh, Peter Colt is the guy's name. But and, Peter uh, Colt, Colt, yeah, which I'm sure is a a nom de plume. But uh, he lives he lives in in Providence, not too far from Frank, and uh, he uh, okay. he 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 was in the sandbox, but he certainly didn't go to Vietnam. Didn't. But he asked me a lot of questions, you know, once we started communicating. So I, I told him, I said, he said, I want to put, uh, I want to put Rourke in a, in a, uh, a covey. And I said, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. I said, put him, put him in a bird dog. <laughs> anyway, you, was um, with, with that Cambodian incursion, since you were involved in that, did you think that that should have happened sooner? Or did, did you even pay attention to the timing? Well, you know, the reason why I paid attention is because my best friends were both flying in the uh, in the first calf, and they were both one of them was flying a Loach and the other one was flying a, a Huey, and uh, these were my roommates when, after flight school before I went to went to fixed wing school, and I was very concerned about them uh, because I, I loved them both, uh, so I paid a lot of attention. Um, if there was, I you know I. I think we should have gone in. I mean, I, I, do, do I, I politically support what we did? Yes, I do. I think we, I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, Frank, you'd have to think about what we didn't do in Vietnam. We had no strategy. We had tactics, but we never had any strategy about what you know what we wanted to do or what we wanted to accomplish, except for the two times that I can think of, and that was going into Cambodia and then Lam San Seven Nineteen, which was also a a, a big mess, but, uh, but I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I did support it. Well, when you, if you, if you read a little bit about McNamara and Johnson and what was going on, it became pretty obvious that they were, they, they, they didn't want to leave and they didn't want to win. So what they were doing was they were marking time. They were playing checkers when they should have been playing chess and, and so that's why we were doing what we were doing because we were blocking that trail, buying yes. to the South Vietnamese to to get up to speed, which they never did, uh, to take on the, the defense of their own country, which they never did. So, well, isn't it nice that uh, you and I and Phil and all the rest of us got to fly for professionals who had a reason for being there and a mission, and they they wanted to do. They wanted to do the right thing rather than be involved with the with the people who were fragging officers and and doing that sort of thing. Which, uh, I, you know, I, I I'm just happy that that if I had to go to Vietnam, if I had to do it again, I'd do exactly what I did. That was that was it was it wasn't. I was always afraid. I was always scared. Every time I flew, I was afraid. But uh, but I was also very proud of what I did. And that's uh, that's that's the way I feel about it. Johnson and McNamara, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I just, I don't even know where to put them in my, in my uh, log book. I mean, I, it, evil is a, a very plain and simple, especially <laughs> McNamara. McNamara was a terrible, terrible human being. Yeah. And so was, so was Lyndon Johnson too, by the way, <laughs> my tech, my set, my second home is Texas. And believe me, I, I know stories <laughs> about Lyndon Johnson that are, just make oh, yeah. throw your toes. Uh, but and there there was one uh I, I I know you're not one to to talk about yourself too much, but considering you were at least involved with one of uh at SOGs, not just CCCs, but SOG's biggest uh missions uh in, in their whole incarnation. Um can you speak a little bit about what, what your role on Tailwind and what you were uh doing while they were on the ground? Uh working yeah i can uh dave teague and i had uh, had flown out there and back with uh, bucky and another guy uh to photograph the area and came back and uh hang on just a second I'll get one of my props here but we we came back and um uh we brief we briefed everybody what we saw and of course bucky had some really good pictures i went i don't i guess he's not able to keep that kind of stuff but boy those there were some good ones because i i went into the photo lab with him uh he he taught me how how to uh, process film and I uh, and so I but I was in the photo lab with him when when he did them um, but anyway 
we came back and they told us when the mission was supposed to go and it was going to go out of Docto. So they asked us if we would uh, come up and do VR around Docto the day the mission left. And uh, of course, you know, we, they didn't ask us, they told us. So, uh, so we flew up and we refueled at, at Docto and it was, I, I, it was just unimaginable to me that what, what they had on the ground there, uh, the, uh, the twin engine Cobras, the twin engine Hueys, the, the Jolly Greens, all the other stuff that, that just was not congruent with, uh, with Doc Toe. That stuff had never been there before. And so it's pretty obvious that uh, any kind of network would know that something big is getting ready to happen. And since, since we'd flown over, over uh, Tailwind, uh, they probably must have known that we were that that's where we were going to go. Uh, so they positioned, you know, they positioned on the um, on the hillside back uh, south of Docto, and uh, they waited until the weather moved in, and then they started uh, shooting rockets and uh, one one twenty two millimeter rockets. And uh, so we, anyway, we were in the air at the time, and so we we said, well, we'll VR the area, and we were talking to. Uh, the Pink Panthers who are also doing the security for the area also. And I flew down low and uh, Dave was high. And I said, Dave, I, I see them. I know where they are. And, uh, and, I, and I said, I can mark them. And so anyway, I, I came back around and I shot a rocket and missed them by a bunch, but, uh, but I was able to, to adjust from there. And uh, the, the Pink Panthers rolled in just right underneath me and started shooting nails at them. It was so close. I could see the red stuff coming out of it. And I, and I talked to him, I said, I said, you guys are nuts. I said, I'm, let me get out of the area before you keep, before you do this. And so anyway, I, I, they didn't, they didn't put holes in my airplane, but uh, later on, actually one of the pink Panther pilots was from my flight school class, my, my rotary wing flight school class. And, and he told me, he said, I knew it was you. And he said, he said it, I wasn't going to hit you, but I just wanted to make sure you knew I was up there. <laughs> And this was over a, over a beer at the club at at uh, Play Coo. But uh, anyway, that's uh, that was what we did afterwards. But um, here it is, the, uh, oh, the famous plaque wow. that they did not give to us. Uh, this was uh, what they gave to everybody, all the people that participated in the uh, in the mission. And uh, it says to the two nineteenth for participating in Operation Tailwind, which they did not give to us. Uh, at the at the ceremony, uh, while Dave and I stood there and looked looking stupid, uh, but uh, later on Bucky got it for us, and I, and I could have left it with the two nineteenth, but the two nineteenth was going to stand down sometime soon after I left, so I'm not going to do that. I'm taking it home, so it's mine. Wow, they can come get it if they want it. The um, th that's that that's such a good point that they didn't give it to you, but to be honest. If you asked any of those guys, they have no goddamn idea who we were. No, they didn't. You're they right. couldn't name us. They, a, 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 we were Spaff. That was it. The only guy that they knew was a guy that was supposed to be here today, but he's not John Myers, and he was Fat Spaff. Because <laughs> 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 he was a big guy. So he, they called him Fat was, Spaff. And, John is a really big guy, right? Big guy. And uh, um, so, but we were anonymous. I mean, we lived on a compound, and and uh, and Glasshauser and Krupa lived in the hooch next to us, the Phil and me, and uh, that's when Glasshauser broke the wall down, <laughs> and um, and covered me with covered me with saltines. So there's Phil, and Doug to his right, and me, and that's uh, Frank over there on the on the far right. Oh, uh, that picture I think was it Playku? I mean at Contum. I think was, I think I think that was yeah yeah it was that's that's Contum. Yeah, I, I think it was Contum. Uh, but I uh, again, that's uh, we were uh, we were extremely arrogant. Uh, we uh, uh, you know I, I think that's probably the right word, but we we're pretty proud of ourselves, and we were very. Did y'all have, uh, it looks like y'all have, uh, I can't tell if they're watches or do y'all have Montagnard bracelets on or some kind oh, of yeah. bracelets? We did. I, I, I had bracelets and beads. Wow. Yeah, I did. Did, uh, did I send you the, yeah, I, I'm sure I had a Mountain Yard. I still have one, uh, a uh, Mountain Yard bracelet. 
Brandon. I don't, I don't. I wish I had one, but I don't have one. Well, we can get you in touch with one of the SOG men that is in touch with the Montagnard Nation in North Carolina to get you a replacement. Well, I would love that. That would be – actually, I'd well, get a bunch of them. Give me my grandsons. That would be me, really cool. Let me write a note right Thank now you. to – Get you a yard. I'm proud about that. You know, I've got, I've got two, but I got two grandsons, so I can't do that. I have three grandsons, so I, I can't. No, do you can't be giving those out. They, yeah, your grandsons, once they yeah. figure out the significance of that, they. Wait, wait till they get, they get in my safe deposit box after I'm gone and see my staff medal. <laughs> that uh, that's what Bucky was talking about. The guy, the uh, Tac Capital Gems, he made those things, and he just he made us all kind of jewelry and stuff, but. Uh, but Phil and I both have big medals that say SPAF on them. <laughs> you you uh, we'll get to some more questions here in a second, but I, I this had to be spoken about because this is a legendary uh, uh, SOG man. Um, he ran West Virginia. Uh, I think he was 1-1 and then 1-0, but uh, Lieutenant Michael Forte, and of course there you are. Uh, did you happen to know Mr. Mike uh, in Vietnam or did y'all not? I, I did not, uh, you know, you can't imagine how surprised I was that I got a training officer. This is toward the end of my command of, of, of the basic training company. And uh, I had three training officers and he was the last one. And the other two were, uh, were butter bars. They, they had, uh, they had no experience. And here comes this guy. And I, and I saw the stuff on his chest and I said, Oh, wait a minute. I know, I know, I know what you were doing. <laughs> and well, we sat down and we talked about it for a long time, but uh, I, I did not know him in Vietnam. Wow. He, uh, he was definitely quite the stud uh, that I've heard about and read about. I, I didn't ever get to speak to him personally or meet him, but uh, by all accounts, he was one hard charger for sure. Is he still with us? Do you know? Uh, cannot answer that uh confidently enough to say sir i will find out but i have not yeah. heard from him uh mr ronnie knight is in the group and i'll uh message mr ronnie and find out yeah I, i'd like to know uh he was he was the uh, ultimate uh junior officer he was he invited my wife and i to to his house for for dinner with he and his wife and uh he was uh he was a very very uh an ex extremely talented guy I, but like I said, it was uh, toward the end of my, my command. I commanded, I think, 14 or 15 months. And uh, then uh, I turned it over to another guy. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was really interesting that he showed up there. That is uh, such a small world, the the military, and especially at that you time. That, just... that picture show, when that picture came up and I saw it, wait a minute. I know that guy. Um, Stephen was curious. Uh, nope. That was the wrong one. Steven, I'll get to yours. Uh, there was one right before yours. I'm sorry. Um, actually, I guess it was that one. Um, I got caught with tools and import restrictions. Oslo's getting there. I was on my own. and Oh, he was talking about his flight into Russia. Okay. Good oh. Lord. Wow. Got caught with tools and import restrictions in Oslo getting there. I was on my own, and he, you are on your own. Wow. That's uh, pretty he, Has you he ever heard of Brittany Griner? Uh, I'm sure I, I would imagine so. Most of us have. She she definitely got herself off on her own. Uh, yeah. Stephen Walsh, uh, you guys could probably explain it. I can just give basis. Can you explain the difference between what a one zero and the zero one is? Yeah, um, zero one is an airplane. <laughs> one, oh, zero, one zero is a team leader. <laughs> oh, the one zero the one zero was in charge of the recon team that went in on the ground. So RT Maine. RT Virginia, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. He was he ran the show. The one one was the second in command. The one two was generally the radio guy. Um, oh, and oh one it was uh, either a uh, first a second lieutenant uh, a bird dog. or a bird dog. Also, it on the indigenous side of the house, the zero one and the zero two. The zero one is the indigenous team leader oh, that's right you're right and the zero two is the second in command yeah yep yep, yep. you know one thing that uh, that should be uh, brought up too is that the uh the one zeros was was ranking material uh it it was all it's all experience so yeah. it could be a buck uh, buck sergeant leading a captain or whatever but uh, it was uh, all ranking oh. material plaster and krupa, krupa yeah, exactly. was, a plaster yeah. was a staff sergeant yeah exactly so, 
We, there, uh, I happen to know a spec four uh, down at CCS that was running a team uh, with with sergeants, and uh, it, it's that that's one of the more unique things in SOG. I, that, that's so neat that experience trumps everything else. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, it, 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 it worked. It was certainly uh, the right thing to do. You know, don't put somebody out there that uh, mm. doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -mm. Um, this is a good one for y'all to answer being vets. Uh, Red is a uh, Marine vet, was a Marine Corps vet in Vietnam. Uh, he was wondering, what do you think as aviators was the biggest mistake in Vietnam? And he thinks stopping the bombing of the in, of North Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> what would I yours be? That's Weiler. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, it could be it could be all it could be Vietnam itself. I, I don't I don't know. Uh, it, it was uh, well. It, one thing, like I said before, we had we had no strategy. We had tactics. We we knew tactics. We had no strategy, and then we allowed the we, we allowed discipline to go to, to go away. It was it was awful. I mean, really, not in the units that I was in, but uh, but it was it was a really a bad situation. We came back. It, Staying in, in, in the army after 1970, 71, it's not good. Mm -hmm. I, I've always thought and been listening and researching and especially speaking to men like Mr. Mike Buckland, I've un, I was under the assumption or now under the assumption that it would probably been better to, of course, had air, but to maybe let the special forces handle it a little more so than introducing so many ground forces into the equation and maybe working in Laos a little more to stop the influx into South Vietnam completely. I, I, I don't know. Maybe not being even alive. That's just me giving my two cents. Well, you know, the Marine Corps had a program where they, <clears throat> they put uh, a, a, a group of guys like a platoon. combined action platoons. Yeah, a platoon-sized unit in in a village, and they lived with them, and uh, and it uh, who the hell was, it? was it Bing West? I think wrote the village, and uh, it was a it made such great sense, mm -hmm. and um, but we didn't do that, and then you know you you read about these they read about things that occurred where guys refused to fight, and there was a you know, fragging and, and people dying. But then on the other hand, in, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't in uh, Matterhorn, but it was in uh, the way, the, the way they went to war. I think the other book by Morlantis and he writes about charging up a hill and he just took off on it by himself as a, as a first Lieutenant. And when he turned and he got to the top of the hill, they took out a, a, a couple of bunkers that were chewing up his, his, uh, his company. But when he turned around, he was followed by a whole bunch of 19 year olds that followed him. And he never said charge. He just took off and they followed him. So for every good thing that for every bad thing that happened, good things happen. And, you know, for every for every mistake we made, we made we did 10 good things, you know, and and how many units? Uh, looked after orphanages and 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 uh, how many of our uh, 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 medics or boxies looked after people in villages that were ill and 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 we gave them food and all no, I mean we we weren't we weren't monsters and that's what pisses me off we weren't we weren't monsters we 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 did good things and if we had been if we had some sort of a a combined effort where we actually tried to win the hearts and minds of these people instead of herding them into like goddamn reservations. Uh, I, I, I think we actually could have made this work, but we didn't want to. And we it were was very difficult for us to compete against sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. And that's what we were competing against at home. And uh, I agree. It was, it, it we just uh, we didn't we didn't have the talent. We didn't. No. Uh, we, we, and the motivation for the people who were protesting was uh, a little spurious, I think. But uh, I thought it was I thought it was crap. Uh, it was know, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what it was. Of, and, there were a lot uh, of burn, a lot of bone spurs out there. Yeah. Well, okay. well, yeah. Well, whatever. I mean, I, you're right. But uh, <laughs> that certainly did keep people out of Vietnam. I but I I don't. That's. 
I, that's one of the things that I, I think I, I don't I don't hold it against people who went into the National Guard or who uh, mm. did did those. I mean, everybody had to do what they wanted to do, and you know, my motivation for joining the Army was a little bit different than than yours because you you had no choice. You uh, you 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 signed a a commitment when you when you went to senior ROTC. Uh, I you know I, I I chose to do it because. I didn't have anything else to do. I was, and I was going to get drafted. Well, I, I knew that I was because I, I'd done such a stellar job in academics my first two years, and I didn't become a genius until my junior year, and then it was too late. So I, but I had, you went for the adventure you told me once, and I went because I wanted to fly airplanes, but I wanted to fly airplanes after Vietnam too. And so that was that. That was all part of the plan, and uh, and it worked. You know, and I, I will admit it. I I I I went I went to war against. I I didn't want to, but I did, and I because I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to fly. I wanted to be like my dad, and that's what I did. My dad was a pilot, and I wanted to be a pilot. My uncle was a waste gunner to B seventeen. I did not want to be a waste gunner to B seventeen. So. <laughs> Well, they, they weren't around when we were. It wouldn't we were. matter. I Somehow I would have been doing something <laughs> stupid like that. I, I, you know, I got to tell you, when, when I was in when I was in uh, high school, I uh, I got caught reading uh, one of those books about uh, about World War II, the Marines, and I can't remember which one it was. One of the Leon Uris book or something. But, oh, uh, Guadalcanal Canal Diary. <laughs> but I got, I got caught reading that book, and uh, the uh, the brother who was my uh, brother of Sacred Heart, who was my teacher in, in high school, he says, he says you he says you can't read. He said you can't be reading books like that. You're not old enough. And I said, well, I'm old enough to be drafted. And he said, he said, well, I guess you're right. And but anyway, I, uh, I when I read I read the book, I wanted to join the Marines and go fight fight the Japanese. And I realized that they weren't around anymore. <laughs> I wanted to try to get an in-service transfer into the Marine Corps, but I would only do it if I could if I could go to pilot flight training. And so I went to take my flight physical at the, the Brooklyn Naval Yard and failed it because I had a deviated septum. I couldn't fly jets, so the Navy doctor kicked me out. <coughs> that was that. So I so I, it was the Army. That's where I was going. They they didn't care if I had a deviated septum or not. I had two Marines in my flight school class in my rotary wing class. Uh, when, they uh, actually they were both crazy, but they were uh, Marines. When my father picked me up and he looked at the haircut I had at the beginning of my senior year, and because uh, that I doubled up on RTC in my senior year, and uh, when he when he saw my head, he uh, he went batshit. He was so furious. And when I got home, I I did a rug dance in front of my mother and father. And my dad was, uh, I thought he was going to throw me out. My mother pulled off and walloped me in the face. <laughs> just, she'd never touched me in her life, and she just kablooey. <clears throat> years later, oh, years later, I was visiting her when she was uh, in one of the last years of her life, and she and I were sitting on a porch in a home that she was in. And we were looking at old photographs, and there was a picture of my dad in his uniform, but there were never any of me. And and I, I looked at the photograph, I didn't say anything to her, but I looked at my dad and his, his uh, suntans after he'd come back from uh, India. And she looked at me and through her teeth said, I hated that you did that. And uh, she said, I hated it. And I thought, well, I kind of hated it too. <laughs> so, you know. I wasn't having a great time. So, you know, mom, <laughs> we've got something in common. Yeah. So, but I, you know, I got to go, I got to go flying. And, and so sometimes the ends do justify the means. It, it, yeah. it, it does. And that's actually going to tie into one of my later questions. Uh, we've got two or three more uh, unless some come in. Um, but Jason was curious when we talked to Sogman, they talk about the men recon or hatchet force that they looked up to that they served with. Um, who were some of those men that y'all served with in the 219th or in any of your uh, time in the army that you looked up highly to? Charles? 
Well, I'll tell you, um, until I made lieutenant colonel, I had never run into uh, someone that I really disliked, except for maybe Gus. I worked for some incredibly good officers. And uh, and then uh, at, after I made lieutenant colonel, I ran into two assholes who were my bosses. But uh, the uh, the 219th, uh, Arlie Deaton comes to mind. John Myers, certainly. Uh, Phil and, and, uh, and uh, Frank, uh, who I, did, I didn't know Frank as well as I knew Phil because I, Phil was my neighbor. Uh, Phil's been around me for most of my life, but uh, but uh, they were they were certainly good guys. Uh, the people that I flew with were always uh, uh, really uh, really really good people. Um, I wound up working for uh, a whole bunch of people who made uh, lots of stars, uh, especially when I was in 101st. Flying Chinooks in the 101st, and whole, every single one of the uh, brigade commanders in the 101st when I was there uh, got promoted to uh, Brigadier General at least, and most of them made two or three stars. Uh, a couple of them made four. Um, so, I, I, like I said, I really I worked for really good people. I, the Army uh, Army is, has really got a lot of talent. It just back, back, back then, it, was, it amazed me that these people – were so organized and so talented, and they, uh, they 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 knew how to make decisions, and uh, and I learned a lot from that. And I thought I really did a pretty good job uh, until the last part of my career. Um, I, but I I just I can't recall anybody in the in the two nineteenth that I didn't like. Uh, I, they were just uh, I mean I and, and a people in, in Army aviation particularly. Uh, Infantry certainly, but in Army aviation, I just um, I, I met some really really good people, and I enjoyed being with them. I would, Mr. Frank. Who, I, would, uh, I would I would second that. Uh, there were one or two guys in the two nineteenth who were dorks, but other than that, it was not a big deal. Uh, Myers and Phil and you. Jerry and, and uh, Doug Kraut, the guys with Bucky and the guys in SOG, they were all terrific people. Uh, the guy that I remember the most, the guy that that, that moved me the most was uh, John Pappas. And uh, I, I liked Pappas because he, he, he looked so terribly benign and he wasn't. He was a hell of an officer. He was a hell of a tactician. He knew exactly what he was doing, um, and I just loved being around him. And then I had a chance to meet Stella, uh, who is a lovely, lovely woman, and I, I, I loved her. I, I just love her. She, she's wonderful. And I met his kids um, when we went to uh, his funeral at West Point, and I, it was one of the most profoundly sad days of my life because, you know, you say goodbye to a guy that's, that's that had a, a tough go the last year. It was a painful disease that he died from and uh, cancer. And and you know the world was a lesser place without him. But but as an officer, as somebody, and it, the guys in his the guys in his class at West Point. Let me tell you, when they they talk about John Pappas, they're talking they are reverential. He was that he was that popular. He was that good a guy. And anybody who had a, a, any, John just knew how to act. He knew how to, 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 to conduct himself. And these guys all knew it. And so John sort of was the, the leader of the class. He may not have been the class president, but he certainly helped everyone there. He just, he's just a good guy, just a good guy. So anyway, that's mine. We, um, uh, Let's see. It's, it's ten after six. How much longer you want to go, Bucko? Uh, I, I'm. Uh, let's see here. I think we've pretty much hit the questions. I was going to ask you, uh, and uh, one question. And I, considering Mr. Jerry didn't do uh, flying uh, professionally or anything, uh, although I, I can kind of rephrase it to to how Vietnam affect uh, not affected him, but helped him later in life. Um. 
How did you feel, Mr. Frank, first off, uh, to close out? How did you feel um, your experience flying uh, the otter and then the bird dog with CCC? How do you feel that affected or helped you uh, become a professional airline pilot? You see Sully and some of these other great pilots that have done some miraculous things, saving aircraft, fall, uh, crashing and stuff like that that turned out to be Air Force and and and, and Army pilots. Uh, what, what did you feel that it helped you? Did did, did you feel that it was a, a a huge help for you? Yeah, I I did I, I, because because first of all I had a couple of instructors who were outstanding, <clears throat> and and the, the one guy especially Mr. Weaver I don't know his first name he was an amazing instructor, and then uh, Ray Carl who was on here a little while ago. Um, and he was my instructor in bird dogs. He was flying for the 220th cat killers. And, and I had Ray as, a, as an instructor in the first phase of bird dogs. But you, when you, when you interview and when you're standing up in front of the rest of your classmates and everybody is a big airplane driver or a fighter pilot or they flew off of carriers and then you're standing there and you flew a tail in the and, and, the, and, and the guys in the back of the classroom are booing and they're, they're laughing, you know, and then the, the, uh, the facilitator who is one of the uh, instructors in, in, in at Western Airlines told me that I was going to have a hard time. I took all that and I thought, well, you know, I, I can fly an airplane by the seat of my pants and <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to take this as a challenge. When this guy told me I was going to have a hard time, I thought, screw you, Jack, I'll show you the first four years that I flew with the airline, I flew in the back of a 737. And so I got to see approaches into snowstorms in Montana and fly across the period at, at dawn and, and fly approaches where you held where you wanted to and, and the, the clearances were kind of nebulous, but, but I watched everything. <clears throat> and then when I moved over to the right seat, every approach was an instrument approach, whether the sun was shining or not, I didn't give a damn. And I, I retaught myself how to fly instruments. In a, in a in a jet <laughs> I've never flown a jet in my life and <clears throat> the guy that checked me out on the 737 uh, at night in Denver a guy named Russ Barger who is one of the best people I've ever known he looked at me and he said you just keep doing what you're doing he said you're you're not the best I've ever seen but you sure as hell aren't the worst and he said you you're doing a great job just just keep doing what you're doing and Russ and I are friends forever and uh, and I just love the guy. And and Russ died of cancer, uh, but he, he he wouldn't stop smoking. It, it it and my dad, my dad was was huge. We never talked about flying. My father and I never. He three times, three times. The day I got hired, and he came out, met me in the driveway, put his hands on my shoulders, and and uh, and said, "You're following, you're you're following in my footsteps. You're following in my footsteps." And then the day that I was going to take my captain's check ride <clears throat> in the simulator, and he called me up, actually he called me the night before the oral exam, and he said, you walk in there like you want to join. And he said, and you just you just answer the questions, and, and then when you get in the airplane, you fly it like you own it. And, uh, and he said, you'll do fine. And that was the other time we talked about it. And then towards the end of his life, and my dad said, you know, and I guess I was getting down to like five or six years to go before I had to retire. And we had to retire at 60 then. And my dad said, it goes so it, go, it goes by so fast, Frankie. It goes by so fast. And he was right. And he was absolutely right. The day that I, the day that I took my last flight, and I, I flew down to Lima, Peru in a 7-6-400, and, and I flew it back, too. I, I generally always shared the legs with a co-pilot, but I didn't this time. And I told him I was my last trip I was flying it. <clears throat> I, um, I told the, fl the flight attendant when we got to Atlanta that when the door opens and the agent 
starts to get the, let the people out, I'm getting off first. And she said, no. And I said, yes, I'm getting off first. And you are not going to say anything to anyone. Because if I get trapped in here, these people are going to see me crying. Because I don't want to leave. So I got to get out of here. And, and I did. And I will tell you now that flying is the best thing I ever did in my life. And I miss it every day. I wake up thinking about it. I loved doing it. I loved having Katie on the airplane with me. We saw all of so much of Europe together, you know, because I had, I was very senior and I could get her up in business class and she went with me on damn near every trip. We just, it was just the most fun you could have and get paid. And, you know, you, we used to tell us, I don't know if I've ever told anybody this stuff, but well, I have, but not you guys. We used to overfly West Yellowstone and go into Great Falls. In a, in a 37. And and on the way back, we stopped in West Yellowstone and then flew back down to Salt Lake City. And so we would take a, 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 a full, full load of, air, of people up to uh, Great Falls and then turn around with a whole load of Japanese tourists and go into West Yellowstone. Well, there was a lady there that that had a diner and she made huckleberry pie. So we'd overfly it. We'd call her up and say, make a pie. So, and then on the way back, we'd get it. And, and you would see the flight crew, you know, with pie juice running down their arms, eating pie and flying the airplane. I mean, geez, God, that was fun. That was fun. You know, it was just, how many guys flew an ARC VOR approach in a snowstorm? I did. It was so cool. And it and, and I'm not going to tell you how you did it. It doesn't matter. But it was a it, this obscure damn thing that we did. We used to come over uh, a, a, a fix <clears throat> going into uh, going into to Butte and you would you would cross over this VOR and let down to 11,000 feet and fly to hack the clock and fly to, uh, oh, maybe 10 minutes and make a right-hand turn. And when you made the right-hand turn, that's when you saw the runway. And the reason why you hacked the clock and timed it was because there was a mountain there. If you turned too soon, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. So it was just that stuff. It, it, God, it was fun. And it was just, and it stayed fun. That, uh, like you said, you, you can't find anything better to do and get paid doing it. That's right. That's right. Mr. Uh, Mr. Jerry, what about you? What did, what, what, what did you feel that uh, your time in the military in Vietnam and post Vietnam uh, commanding uh, that it helped for uh, your post military career? I absolutely love the army. I, I, I can't deny that. I never, never knew I would. Uh, but my, uh, my two best friends, Ron Byer and Jim Schofield and I uh, plowed through the army together. Uh, Jim got out after a while, but uh, we, we remained friends. He's since passed away. As a matter of fact, uh, Frank and I were going to go fishing in Montana uh, when I, I was in uh, Colorado Springs, and I got a word from his girlfriend that Jim had passed away. So I had to go to Kansas City instead of going to Montana. But uh, anyway, uh, Ron, Sco Ron, Ron Byer is uh, still my best friend, uh, an Aggie from Abilene, Texas, who uh, – left the army almost exactly the same time I did and came into the army. We went through OCS together, we went through flight school together. Uh, we were stationed together all over the army. So, uh, I, but I, I love the army and I love being a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but, um, there is a, uh, a lapel pin that says I'm a Vietnam veteran and I belong to the military officers association of America. And we do a ceremony every year on uh, Vietnam Veterans Day, where we do the uh, the table for the, with the lost uh, the lost uh, soldier. Uh, but we have I have multiple lapel pins, and as you know, if you go into Walmart, you're not gonna not gonna go there without seeing somebody with a hat on that says I'm a Vietnam veteran. It's just not gonna happen. And so when I see one of those guys, I always walk up to him and I said, "Do you?" Are you a Vietnam veteran? They was, you know, yeah, look at my hat. And I said, do you have, know about these pins? And they, none of, they don't. And so I give them a lapel pin and they're always, oh, 
they're always just they're so grateful and they because they want they want to be recognized as a Vietnam veteran. So they are, and they'll ask you, you know, are you a Vietnam veteran? And I say, yes, I am. And I'm extremely proud of it. And I'm extremely proud of my service. And like I said, I I love the Army. My children were raised in the Army. Both of both of them, as you know, are, are Army officers. Both my daughters are Army officers. Uh, one one of my sons in law is an Army officer and the other son in law is an Air Force officer who just retired. And uh, I, I think part of the reason why my daughters went into the military is because of me. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, they both they're both combat veterans. Uh, multiple times served in served in the uh, in the sandbox, and uh, so I'm extremely proud of them, and I think that's part of it. Uh, so the the answer, Bud, is yes. I I would not be who I am today if it were not for the army. Right. And when I, I found out about your daughters, I knew immediately uh, them knowing about your service had to inspire them, and uh, for them to have risen through the ranks like they have is uh i can only imagine how proud of a father you are of them uh that that's just uh doesn't happen very often both children uh accomplish a goal such as that it, it's just absolutely outstanding and both of you should be very very proud of your service to this nation uh it's uh, uh just outstanding and we're very glad that y'all are on here to share with us and answer all of our viewer questions because it absolutely means the world, not only to me, but to also all of our viewers. Well, well thank, thank you for you giving us the vision. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, anytime y'all want to come on either together, separately, anytime my platform is y'all's platform. Thank you. That sounds, that sounds good. Thank you. thank you, bud. Thank you, yes, bud. Yes, sir. Um, and without anything else, I think we're going to go ahead and shut it down right short of two hours. So uh, we'll go <laughs> ahead and uh, walk, Gary. <laughs> go, go watch the snow fly, Frank. I'm going to. <laughs> Good night. All righty. All righty, guys. We'll see you all later. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. See you